Hello, everybody. I'm Ray. Uh, and welcome to the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast. Today, I'm going to be reviewing some current and classic Lit RPG audiobooks for you, the listener. Um, and today, I'm going to start off with Couch Potato Chaos Game Bound by Eric Rounds, narrated by Sarah Sampino, with a book length of 17 hours and 39 minutes. Tasha was standing on a stone platform in a dimly lit room. Her legs were like wobbly noodles as she stepped down off the platform and onto the main floor. She was barefoot and clothed only in a plain sleeveless white shirt and a simple pair of short cloth pants. A message hovered in the air in front of her. You have died and respawned. Time elapsed in oblivion. One hour, nine minutes. You have lost 5% of your level progress, bringing you to zero XP. She dismissed the message by tapping it away. Respawned? As in, being reborn after death in a video game? Tasha felt different. It wasn't clear how, but she didn't feel the same as before. It was as though she'd changed somehow, that she wasn't the same person anymore. Taking in her surroundings, Tasha quickly realized that she was in the same starting room that she had appeared in earlier. At her feet, clay fragments littered the ground. The large metal box was where she had left it, on the pressure plate. So, <laughs> when I first saw this title, when I first saw it, I said, finally, finally, somebody has written a book for me. Uh, I am a loud and proud and avowed couch potato. So, of course, I was intrigued. Uh, the story is one that you see in nearly every lit RPG novel. You know, the gamer gets sucked into the game. But I have to say that this has a few aspects that really differentiated itself right out of the gate. Uh, the book centers on an unassuming young lady who, who, lady who is pretty much overworked, underappreciated, underpaid, and who was given an option uh, when she is walking home one night. The option is she sees these little signs and, and, and she says they say to her that she can either follow one route to a, excitement and adventure or follow the other path back to uh, warmth and comfort. And I have to say that in this very early part of the book, this was a pivotal moment for me as a listener. I was literally, I said to myself, I will, I will listen to this book if the right choice is made. And if the right choice is made, I will continue happily listening to this novel. If the wrong choice is made, I'm done. I'm just going to shut it off. And I'll say thank you and, and repay them in some other way for letting me listen to that book. But uh, there was no way I was going to listen to a book about a couch potato that chooses the path of excitement and adventure. I said immediately, if it were I, if I were standing in the middle of the road and two signs came up and they said, you may either pick adventure or you may pick comfort. Where am I going to go? My hedonistic butt is going to the comfort zone every single time. And anybody who claims to be a couch potato would do the same thing. So this young lady who who is given this option very wisely, I must say, very wisely makes the choice to go home and get out of the rain rather than get into a game. Pretty much the, the right way of thinking, because you get into games, you get hurt, you get killed. You got to work. You got to walk for miles. There's exercise. Who needs all that? Really? Really? I, I, I don't. I, I don't care if I had a, a virtual body or not. I, I don't need to go out and swing a sword and chop down dragons and stuff like that. I can have a lot of fun just listening to a book. Why do I have to put myself up to here in danger to enjoy myself? I don't. I don't. That's why they make books and things like TV and things. Couch potatoes, in other words. And so I said, you know, this is it. So she made the right choice, and I kept listening. Okay. So, like I said, I just, there's no way a couch potato would ever pick the other path. So with that hurdle jumped, my suspension of disbelief became solid once more, and I settled right into the story. Uh, the book takes its gaming stuff in a very neat direction. I have to say, right off the bat, um, the, the couch potato class uh, that the MC, Tasha, is granted is, is kind of neat. There's, there's certain things like her abilities and strengths fluctuate by how entertained she is. And, and what do I mean? I mean, that if she's bored, she starts going down 
in numbers, and the lower you go, the less benefits and boons you get and the more debuffs you get. Uh, so she wants to keep herself happy. You know, it reminds me of uh, Russell Crowe in uh, Gladiator, you know, screaming, are you not entertained? You, you know, so she has to make herself happy before she gets into a fight in order to enjoy all the benefits. And, you know, I wasn't quite as wowed by the fact that the game dealt with, like, earning hearts and, and magic vials as I was about that aspect of it. Um, but I was absolutely blown away, blown away by the ramifications that death and respawning had. Uh, that concept alone was probably the best part of the book because basically, um, you know, it made the whole story, it made the whole thing, I should say, it made it creepy and not something you just shrug off as, oh, I'm going to just die again. Um, the way it works is that if you die, parts of your personality change. Uh, they change. So, you know, you may actually be a couch potato now, but the next time you turn around, you may like be like, I, I don't want to sit around on my butt all day. I, I want to go out and do something. Oh, my God. What, what, is, what, what is that? Who does that sort of stuff? Crazy people. Crazy people who have to get killed and end up respawning and changing again. Um, but I think that was my favorite aspect because um, when Tasha experiences it for the first time, she knows something is not right, but she doesn't know what. She knows something is different, but she doesn't have a clue how things are different, what's changed about her. Um, and, and the changes are subtle, so they're not, I don't think they're glaring in any way. I, I don't think they come out and go, ha ha, here we are. I think that you kind of you would never notice it. I, I actually, I think that, you know, if it was you that had it happen, you would never realize it. You'd just be like, this is the way I've always been. But your friends who have known you for years be like, what the heck? You know, Ray stopped reading books and, you know, uh, he's taking up smoking and, you know, he's exercising. Well, there's there's a whole lot of stuff that's going on and people say, all right, Ray. And, and that's the way it goes with this. And, and I think that, that, that that was like really awesome. And I also enjoyed the couch potatoes power to stat shuffle. Uh, but I think that was underplayed and could have been used a little bit more. So, you know, there's a lot that happens here that, that you haven't seen in other lit RPG. And I give a lot of credit for that because I like new stuff. I think new stuff is hard to come up with. And I think Eric rounds very deftly very deftly slips in some stuff that you haven't seen before. Um, now, this book has some hit or miss humor. You know, it's bouncing, you know, jokes from, you know, from jokes to parodies. Uh, and, you know, there are riffs on, like, a lot of the 8-bit games and other stuff, pop culture. And, and so it's either, like, you know, it really it really works or it, it kind of just, yeah, it, you know, pops. So, you know, it's, it's a, you know, hit, hit, swing and a miss swing and a miss, hit, hit, uh, that sort of thing. And I can handle that. I, I don't have a problem with that because not everything is going to be funny to me or somebody else. I, I think that, you know, that's more accurate. Like, if you watch comedians, very few comedians kill with every single joke. We can't all be Brian Regans. Um, and even he has some clinkers. Um, and, and I think that was it. So th there's there's some really good references and nods. And, and speaking of nods... I really have to say, there's a shout out to War Eternus in this book, so that gives it yeah right there for me because I love the War Eternus. You know, W A is awesome. Um, now, overall, this book kind of transitions into what becomes known as like a slice of life piece. And if you you've listened to me talk, you know I'm not a big fan of slice of life unless it comes from Dexter Morgan. So. Um, I really have to say that, you know, it was for me, it, it was, it was really good for a certain point, but when you're talking, you know, over 15 hours for a book and it just seems like it rambles, I, I that I don't like, I, I like to have points to my novels. If it's going to be a big, long, bouncy novel, I, I think you need to have like a, a direction to follow. Like if there's the sign that says action and adventure is here, show me the action and adventure, make there be a point get to it and we can go to the next book and go through and i think honestly i think that the, the, the size of the book is probably a detriment to a certain extent because like i say if if you trimmed out some of the the end jokes uh and a little bit more 
it would have been a little bit smoother flowing and it would have been quicker and I think it would have worked a little bit better you know I would have said if you had a 12 hour book it would have probably been perfect not that I'm complaining about it. like I said I, I write I like the book but it was it was big and it was a slice of life and I'm not a big slice of life kind of guy not at all uh, now my only real complaint is the portrayal of autism in a book now speaking as a father of two children who actually have autism I, I don't think that Eric realizes just quite how autism works now, again, I will humbly apologize if Eric has kids or he has someone close to him that has the illness, but it didn't come across like you, you were familiar with it, and maybe you'd only read about it, um, because it, it just looked like the perspective of someone who has sort of an idea of what autism is rather than what it's really about, uh, because the, the character who has the autism, the, there were just the, the, the thought processes and behaviors just didn't mesh up and i don't want to go into it i want to dissect or pick apart things that's not fair but i think that was like my only big big problem with the book was that and that's that's really small it's just a, it's just a character thing and i can deal with it i really can uh, but i wanted to just point that out that was kind of like if i had to pick something that was going to be my issue more than anything um now, I will say, that, like I said before, the book needed some trimming. Uh, there were some things that just felt like they were tossed in to make sure they got tossed into the book. They needed to make it there. But I think for the you know debut novel, it, it should have been, like I said, about 12 hours. It would have flowed so much easier, um, and, and it wouldn't have had all that other stuff in there that we just didn't need. Um, but I will say that it has some really good secondary characters. Ari and, and Pan, um, they're really neat. Uh, I, I think they're probably, you know, some of the best secondary characters you get in the, in the book. Uh, so there's that. There is that. Uh, but, like I say, there, there, that was my big, big issue. Uh, but I, I really think that, and, and I probably sound like I really didn't like the book, and that's not the case. Um, but again, I, I have to say, I don't like Slice of Life, and the book was a little sprawling for a Spice of Life book. Spice of Life. It's a slice of life book. Um, so, you know, you have that and, and just the, like I said, I was just pointing out my autism issues. Um, the, the book was good. I enjoyed it, but I did have a couple little hiccups with it. Um, the narration is, is, is pretty good too. I'm not familiar with Sarah Sampino, but, uh, you know, prior to this, I hadn't heard of her. I think she did an excellent job. I, I think the only thing was there were a couple times on occasion where I had a little difficulty telling apart who was speaking until they were tagged in a sentence, as in, like, Ari said, or Pan said, or, you know, or so on and so forth. Uh, her style and delivery were nice, and it was pleasant to listen to as she told the story. I, I think that you know, she she was, she was has a really nice melodic voice, um, a very nice tone. I, I really enjoyed listening to her. Uh, she has nice pacing. So there's, there's a lot of benefits to things. But like I said, there was just a couple of things where I didn't know who was talking at certain points. And, you know, that's just, you know, differentiate the voices a bit as you go through. Try to give somebody, even if it doesn't say, like, you know, uh, they have an Irish accent, give them a slightly Irish accent or, you know, some sort of a speech impediment or something. Just so you know, like, this is this is Bob, this is Dave, this is Sam. And, and I think that would have helped out a little bit. Just something to work on. But I think that she was really nice. I think she has a really good voice for this. And, you know, given some time, I think she would really fitting well with the community uh you know just has to get her her, her dues paid i guess uh my final score is a 7.7 7, uh with the extra point thrown in for you know we turn so you know it would have been a 7.6 um i think there's a lot of potential for the next book i would just cut it back a little bit because like that's like my big trim for the score was it was a slice of life book that really just kind of went all over the place um, when it could have been a straight line and, and been a little bit shorter and it would have been much better and a tighter book is much better and I'm going to just give you guys a warning because um, I know there are people out there uh, the book does end on a cliffhanger and it drives some people just absolutely crazy when you do that so I, I, I'm not going to tell you what the cliffhanger is or what kind of cliffhanger it is but it ends on a cliffhanger and so if you have that kind of a I don't want to do cliffhangers. This is one of those books. Now, I always say I never have a problem with cliffhangers. As long as I know that the, the author is going to continue the story, I will trust that 
it will work out. So I don't have a problem with cliffhangers. I like them. I think that they work. I think that they, they keep you interested. They keep you wanting to read the next book. You know, you, I got to find out what happens now. So I think, it, you know, Eric, he, he kind of pulled me in on that one too because I do want to know what happens next. So 7.7 with just a couple points off for small things. All right, so next up, I get to, uh, this is awesome. I get to review Fragments, Somnia Online, book three by Casey Hanna, narrated by Andrea Parsno, with a book length of 12 hours and 15 minutes. Jenna turned a little, raising an eyebrow at her. None of you ever read the law, do you? As in seriously? Murmur had the grace to blush, but it probably wasn't visible in this low light anyway. There's just so much else to get a good grasp on. Especially when it doesn't allocate you the class you were expecting, right? Jenna winked at her before going back to studying the board in front of them. He was muttering to himself, his eyes closed. Hightower, Hightower, Hightower. Suddenly, his eyes flew open and he grinned, more to himself than to anyone else. For a second, Murmur felt like an intruder. Dunforth Hightower. He's the ruler of the undead dwarves. Something about taking his men with him when an ice meteor hit the castle. Uh, preserving them for all eternity to serve with them and never die. Uh, something like that. Jenna's smile held an eagerness Murmur hadn't seen before. Well, we make it back to the land of Somnia, and things have really improved. If you saw my last review of the book, you know that one of my biggest issues was the war uh, that murmur had just snapped was that you know murmur had just snapped out over her predicament um you know which is she's trapped in the game and how it sort of drove the entire story the entire time and by that i mean her anger was just like aimed at everybody uh, you know whether they're friend foe whatever um and it wasn't like something that she got mad about and then let go it was something that she she kind of hoarded she clung to uh and, and i mean she parsed it out at every chance she had um and it wasn't fun um you know i'm not saying it was a bad book i liked book two a lot you'll see my score that i gave it it was it was a really good book but it, it, that was like the, the least favorite part of my my reading or listening uh, to it was that it went on for so long i think it should have been like a part of the book like a third maybe even half but then we should have got over it Thankfully, she's passed all that for the most part. I mean, she's got some issues with her mother yet, uh, but but things have changed. Uh, so the good news is we now see brief glimpses of that anger over how she was treated for the most part. This book finally gets back to you know business. Uh, Murmur and her team are leveling and learning bits of the secrets of the world she's trapped in. Honestly. This is the way the last book should have gone. Uh, you know, Murmur's acceptance should have come a lot sooner, and the way that she dealt with her coming to terms with things should have been, you know, a much easier path than, than what we got. But here it is. As things go, this book picks up where the last book left off, but it also picks up its tone. Uh, to me, the last book was about some self-pity and misplaced anger. This book returns to the hopeful Murmur. Uh, that I really enjoyed before. Uh, the other characters, they, they also kind of transitioned from being just like background people because, you know, honestly, the, the only character that was really fleshed out was Harlow or Sin, her best friend. Um, everybody else was just kind of like, okay, I'm this character, you know, that here, I'll, I'll just give it like, that's the paladin, that's the warrior, that's the cleric, that's this, and that's what they were. And then here you kind of get a better feel for who they are now. They're, they're actually... They're real people. They, they come out more. Uh, they have personalities and depth, uh, and other than just we're here to protect Murmur. Uh, there's a lot more to it now. Not that they weren't developed, but here they all get a chance to shine. They all get a chance to stand out. And I think that uh, before I would have been hard pressed if you had said, here's a line, pick who says this. I wouldn't have been able to tell you what member of the team would have said it, maybe. Um, now I could. I could probably say this is, this is who. This said, this is who said this, this is who said this, and, and nail it. I'd probably get it pretty well. Um, but I could have done that before. So they, they, they really come to life more here than they did before. Uh, Murr and her team tackle two dungeons uh, and in search of some keys uh, to the world that will provide them with great power uh, and help them deal with upcoming events. Now, I want to stress, this 
and it is a pleasant surprise to not get hampered down with the usual hack and slash smash mentality that usually infuses little RPG novels. Uh, not that I don't think that, you know, hack and slash isn't great, but to watch somebody use their head to figure things out, it's also just as fun. The characters actually do think they use their heads in order to succeed. And it's just nice to get that. E even though, you know, I respect the other as much, I, you know, I do like a good beheading just as much as I like seeing someone use their head. So, you know, it was, it was a nice change to see them working together to figure things out and, and making it work. Cause it, it was just, it was just a, a nice change of pace for me. Uh, and you know, th that is the thing with this book. Like the, the, the Somnia online sort of is a long game kind of book. It, you know, people could, could argue with me that it's a, a slice of life. And I'm going to say it's not because there is an overarching event. Like, you know, if you took each book and just said it was a chapter, I think you would see that there's a big point that you're you're missing right now, but there's there's a lot that happens that it's not a slice of life. There's actually points to everything, and you go from here to here to here to get to the end. Um, we just haven't gotten the whole picture just yet. Uh, I know that KT Hannah has you know a certain number of books planned, which is great. I love to know when they they yep yeah, we definitely have an end in sight. Uh, rather than this is just going to go until it goes. Um, so with her having that that being said. I know that everything that she's done up to this point, there's points to it that's leading us somewhere we just don't see yet. And so, like I say, it's not technically a slice of life. Just like there was no real villain in the first book. There was no real villain in the second book. Uh, there's no real villain in the third book. If you want to look at it, um, there is one, but I, I still don't think that they qualify as being the main villain of the book. There's nothing that they really did to drive things. In fact, most of the story was told before the villain, um, that you might call them the main villain, pops up and does all their crazy changes. So there's something more to the story, and I, and that's one of those things I enjoy because you get to kind of figure things out as you go along. So And it also, it was nice seeing... Hannah changed things up with the AI as well. There is far more afoot uh, than even the top game controllers out there know. And by that, I mean the AIs, uh, which means either things are going really pear-shaped in the game really fast, or one of the AIs is just flat-out lying about what they know. Um, and by that, I mean that there's an event that occurs that something happens to an NPC, and all three of the AI say, I had nothing to do with this. Uh, this just kind of happened all unto itself. It's a spontaneous generation of, and I won't go into it, but I, but either one of them is lying or things have gotten really bad in the game. And it's, it's even worse because poor Murmur is trapped. And they're, they're, once they find out about her, they're going to do a lot of stuff. They're going to shut the game down or they're going to pull her out. So she's she's kind of screwed one way or the other. No matter what happens, she's in serious trouble. Now, if it's the latter, if it's the latter, if it is one of the AIs lying, I don't think it's the, the, the AI that wants to eat all the brains of the one guy that blew up in there. Uh, I, I think he's sneaky, but I don't think he's that sneaky. Um, I, you know, so I'm not putting it on him, which means it's either the one that, that is the sneaky one, the, you know, the, the sister, or it's the one we all know and trust. So it's hard to say that, like I say, Hannah plays this long game and it's neat to watch just how far out she's got stuff planned, uh, because you can tell that she's, she knows where she's going 90% of the time without ever having to get a map out. Okay. Um, either way. Either way, the story itself has some real depth, uh, and the danger that Murr is in continues to grow, uh, both inside and outside of the game worlds, and she is only partially aware of what is really going on around her, and all the plots to stand to kill her permanently, uh, one way or another. Um, I do think that Hannah has really got her footing back with this story, and that's not to say that she didn't, you know, do well on book two, or but book one was really fantastic. Uh, book two, there was kind of some slippage, but you can plainly see she's gained back her traction with this book. The characters all pop. They all pop. The plot is no longer derailed by Murmur's anger, and she seems amped up with the, the growth that she's finally beginning to display. Now, 
While Murmur seems to grow more in levels than she does emotionally, this book, you know, before, this book actually gives us both. So before, you know, she was either, you know, doing something emotionally or she was just leveling. Here, we get to see um, her go beyond who she was. You know, she, she lets go of some issues she has. And she tries to do the right things and be smart about it. So, you know, she's no longer just acting out in anger irrationally. And, and you know, so it's pretty cool that they give us both, you know, that she, she can, you know, grow emotionally and level up. Now, as I've said it before, I'm going to repeat myself here. Andrea Parsnow just continues to grow as a narrator. The woman can infuse so much emotion into even the most minute dialogue that it forces me to say that not all of the best actors are on screen or win Academy Awards. Seriously, she vocally animates this book and brings it to life in a way that is rarely captured on the silver screen, let alone just off the page of a book. For an audiobook, this is absolutely magical. Uh, she literally makes me see facial expressions about the character she's talking about that are so fully realized that when a character speaks, I, I have no question, you know, of how they look, the, you know, the look on her face, the, the way their eyes squint or something. It, it, it just comes right out. And I, I will say, uh, you know, she drives a scene like Mario Andretti in, in, while he's in the Mach 5. And, you know, again, I'm going to apologize to all you guys that are under 30, but if you don't get the reference, go look it up. Um, but I think, and I'm going to take, take a turn of another book here. Um, and Dan the Adventure, because I've also read that, and I'll be reviewing that soon. Um, there is this one scene where the word please is used. And as much as I was against what was the please was for, um, because it's not my bag, baby. It just ain't my bag. Uh, I was like, oh, come on. Just just do it. You got to do it. You got to help. You know, the, the please was so effective and I'll probably bring that up again with Danny Adventurer but only Andrea could have done that to me I mean she like I guess I've said this the last two times I've reviewed these books with KT Hanna she infuses so much emotion into these stories it amazes me I don't know how she does it seriously seriously I don't have that much emotion in my life I can't do that I just don't go out and, and convey yeah, feelings i just don't have that power um and she does it without even trying it seems like just without even trying um the lady is a true master vocalist and she can tell a story um, i'm always impressed uh so like i say she she just knocks this out of the park uh and again she does it again with the other book that I'm, i just talked about the danny adventure um the final score here is 8.3 uh this serialized novel Finally feels like it has a purpose again and a direction that we had in the first book has returned. And I'm glad to see it's got its legs back. It's, it's seriously, it needed its legs back. Uh, this, this is one of those things I think now that, you know, she's got her footing and we're going to just charge ahead and really take care of business. And insomnia is a fascinating world. I really enjoyed it a lot. Uh, it, it just, it's got great characters, great races, great speed. You know, great abilities. You know, I think Charles Dean asked if you had to pick one, you know, MMO to go live in or something like that. You know, what video game would you go live in? I would go live in Somnia, uh, because that world is, is interesting and it's not like, you know, hyper, hyper violent, uh, go out and kill everything. Uh, you get to use your head and, it just seems like it's a fun, fun world. So that that's what I would say. But 8.3 stars, I think that the, the book continues to evolve and is growing well, and I can't wait to see what happens next. And now, my Sambu Spotlight for this week is Harbinger of Ash, War Eternus, Book 4. Uh, written by the amazing Charles Dean, narrated by the ever-incredible Jeff Hayes and Annie Ellicott. With a book length of 14 hours and 37 minutes. Even after his death, the first man's lessons continued on. There is nothing depraved about sleeping with plenty of women, drinking tons of liquor, and enjoying all the finer points in life. 
but his teachings did not perish with him. So, do we kill one of them for show, make sure they know what's what? The teachings branched out and covered the first man's descendants in a blessed shade. Well, you heard the deities. We need to press on and kill a bunch of people. And so they made their own son. I introduced him to one of my buddies, and Brian showed him how to handle a sword. Except Brian was a zombie. Building fires out of lies to illuminate themselves with their own nature. And the next thing I knew, I was in this fantasy world where she was explaining how to fight, showing me some cool moves, teaching me how to use my inventory. Society then progressed with men fighting over possession in absence of necessity. It knows how to make wooden spears, iron spears, steel spears, 30 different grips, and multiple different methods of decoration. Hunting the beasts that appeared in the shadows cast by lies instead of the real game. The NPCs? Nah, they're fine. They can be concubine one and two. In fact, we can get you ten concubines if you want. That walked in the sun outside of the shade. It's kind of a long and a short story. Well, Dean definitely darkens the tone of book four. But in a good way, in a good way. I, I think that Lee is kind of like becoming his moral sounding board and lets him see what he can get away with. For example, in the last novel, um, he, he went to a point where, you know, they were just killing the weak, uh, the sickly. It was, it was the culling, of course. So you would get rid of those, those people, those, those creatures, those, whatever they were, uh, because they weren't, uh, viable for what they needed to be. And so he was trying to see, you know, what's really moral? Is it right to do something like that? Well, of course not. But in certain instances, maybe it should be applied. And, and so, like you say, he, he's got this moral sounding board with Lee that he, he now applies um, this way. I, I want to go into too much because I don't want to spoil things. But Lee does does a lot of really terrible things all in the name of goodness. You know, and the road to hell is totally paved with good intentions. And, and I think this is the, the, the way that Dean drives that point home. I think that's really what he's trying to get to here is that there are times that in order to do the right thing, you really, really got to do the wrong thing. You got to do the hard thing or the bad thing in some cases. And that might include just, you know, stabbing somebody in the eye just because. I don't know. But but that that's kind of what War Eternus 4 has kind of shown me anyway with Lee's character. Lee has this, this really hard road that he has to get through, uh, that he has to travel uh, to become like who he's going to become. And it's not somebody he likes. Um, you know, he, he's well aware that he's becoming, you know, more and more a, a different person every day. Like he'll say, you know, when I first got here, this is not what I've done. This is not who I was. But I kind of see the way things have to go. And, and I don't know if it's because he has Dave and Miller and, and crazy J Jade, you know, kind of pushing him to do certain things, or if he just realizes that sometimes it takes a, a, a hard man to make the tough decisions, and, you know, you don't always get to be happy and live happily ever after with what you've done. Uh, there are consequences to your actions, even though you do them for the right reasons. So I mean, the, the book has like a whole other level that you don't usually see, and I don't want to say that in little RPG, I'm just saying it in novels overall. Um, you know, Dean really likes to dig into those those moral quandaries sometimes. So you, you, you know, this this is this is book has some some depth to it. Uh, in the last novel, uh, a new character, Jade, was introduced, and I know that she's a character that Charles absolutely loves. But I also know there are some people, not myself, that don't share that sentiment. I kind of like Jade, uh, but then she's really similar to another character from the Bathroom Night, uh, a series that is something my kids and I both love very dearly. Um, and we absolutely loved her. Stephanie was just fantastic. And, and I, I think that in this book, Jade really, really grows as a character. And a lot of her personality is explained. It helps to flesh her out and, and give some gravitas to, like, all the the craziness that she, she does. I mean, uh there's, there's just so much that goes on with her. Uh, and Lee kind of comes to terms with the fact that he's not only going to have to do some dastardly crap in his time, you know, during his time in the game, but that also includes the possibility of him cheating on Masha with Jade or with Lang or possibly with Brigid. I don't know. There's just so many things that happen in this book. Um, but Jade really kind of comes to the foreground. And, and she's pretty much there. She's like, you know what? I already realized. 
Um, you're going to have, like, you know, you got all these chicks, these babes, they want you badly. Um, as long as I'm number one, I'm your waifu number one, her words, uh, it's fine with me. You got to go out and have some fun and you got to take care of business. I'm cool with it. So, you know, I can see where we're heading with that. Um, so you just kind of have to say, this is not a harem book, but it may become that in the future. It's hard to say. Uh, Lee is really kind of like a one woman guy. And I appreciate that. I like Masha a lot. I like her a lot. She's probably my favorite character of all the women because she's real. She's down to earth. Um, and even though there are some struggles between her and Lee in this novel, uh, it doesn't take away from who she is. I think that um, she'll come to terms with everything that's happened and what the revelations are that come out. Uh, because there's a lot of stuff that happens, a lot of stuff that happens in the real world, even though you're only there for a very brief period of time. Now, there's not a lot of time in the real world, so to speak. Uh, and, and when they are there, just stuff happens. It's just craziness. Um and like I say, this book has a lot of stuff going on in it. Not the least of which is the pretty much out of the blue revelation regarding Mosh's father. And there are a couple of amazing characters that just kind of show up. I can't remember their names. It, it was something like um, Johnson and Ray. I, I don't know. They, but they really, they really, well, they just, they did something to this book I just can't explain. It was amazing. Uh, they stole every scene that they were in. I just, I love those guys. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It was nice to get a shout out, Charles. Uh, and, and it was nice to give, like, Lars a shout out and things like that. And that's what I love about, like, the lit RPG community is that uh, from time to time, they'll give a wink and a nod to the other people in the community just as a way of saying, hey, I know you're out there, and thanks for being part of us. Uh, you know, that's like uh, Dave. I don't, I don't know if I can spill the beans on who I think he is, but, um, you know, I think that if you think the curmudgeon of Lit RPG, you pretty much know who Dave is. <laughs> I could be really wrong on that, but I doubt it. Really doubt it. Um, but on a serious note, on a serious note, i got to go back to being serious now. Um, the book never slowed down. And when they weren't fighting, there was intrigue amongst the gods. Um, Lee finally gets to meet some relatives. Uh, he gets a revelation about his relatives. Uh, and he he comes to see Jade in a new light. Uh, we also get the return of Brigid, uh, which is nice. Uh, we meet one of her relatives uh, and get to deal with the crazy new Herald, who kind of makes Freddy Krueger look like a Sunday school teacher. Okay, uh... I don't want to go into it too much, but there's two heralds in this book, and they they both kind of have their their factors. Like the one you just want to punch in the face from the moment you meet him. Uh, the other there there's a creepiness that goes on there that just it's elevated to certain levels. It just it's you just can't get past it uh, because it's it's really genuinely creepy. Um, so I'll hand it to Dean. Um, the writing is tight, and fast paced. It's quick witted. All of his jokes land and stick it. Like, stick it. You know what I'm saying? This is some of his best work. And I'd say, I say that putting him up against anyone in the field. Um, the series only continues to improve a long way as we roll through everything. I think that my favorite part of this book, amongst everything that goes on, and there's a lot that happens here, was seeing how the disarmable trait, or whatever you call it, I, I don't know, it's, it's, but Lee did something and his honor just kind of kept going downhill, and every time he turned around, he would do something and get it worse. So he's like in a negative three at the start of the book. And so, um, you know, sometimes y you see Lee do things because his his traits cause him to do certain actions. We get to see what the dishonorable uh, trait kind of does, and it, it was just it was so funny. It made me laugh out loud. And it's little stuff like that that is so well thought out that it just it adds so much to the series, even though it was minor. Uh, it, was, it was very impactful for me, and it makes it, the series stand out because I believe that his dishonorable status is going to play a much larger role later on in the future. There's going to be a reason why they show this now, uh, even though it was a, a like a kind of offhanded joke about like you know how Lee does react to things and, and and things happen because of this trait. I think there's going to be a massive ramification. I'm hoping later on in the series uh, where 
things happen out of his control because you know he, he had no idea what happened was coming so it's nice it's it's nice to see that sort of stuff come up i want to talk about sound booth this is their spotlight after all and they do such an amazing job here there are dream sequences that have this eerie background noise that is hyper effective in amping up the raw creepiness factor uh their sound effect works and i mean wait i'm, I'm gonna back it up the creepiness it really really does it's it's kind of like a nerve uh, you know scratching uh, or how about a nail across the, the the chalkboard kind of a feel like you just listen to it and you're like Ugh, i can't deal with this uh, it just amps it up and makes it so much more real um because it it's supposed to be creepy and it works it's it's just it works so well uh, and like i said before as I, I started before the sound effects work so sublimely uh like you know there's just parts where things happen and you hear this sound effect and you're, you don't even ask why did they do that it just fits it fits in so well it works well and if they didn't do it if i if i had to go back and listen to it again i would be like why isn't this here what well, there should have been like you know the sound of a sword clang or, you know, the a ball rolling across the floor. Stuff like that, it really works. And the Miller's Shout, for example, the Miller's Shout, it, it, it really feels like it rolls through the air. I mean, like, it just it just kind of goes, like you're hit with this force wave of sound. On, like you're listening to it on surround sound with a force wave that smashes you in the face. I mean, it, it's really, really nice how they do this. And Jeff and Annie really bring out the best in their characters. But they also make the verbal banter and repartee fun. Jeff, absolutely, he, he knows how to read a humorous scene and then flip it right over to be pissed off in the next breath. Uh, he's got this Olympic-level verbal gymnastics skill. It's scary how good he is. And he really blows Brigid out of the water this, this, this go-around with a mix of humility and honor. And I think the scene which Brigid uh, confronts Lee about their emotions is uber-powerful. Uh, and I will say that is romance rating right there. If ever I've seen it, uh, there, there is, there is just stuff there. And as much as I hate it because I'm a Masha fan, team Masha all the way. Um, but it is, it's, it's very a romantic scene, um, in which they, they both bear their emotions, their feelings, uh, and, and they, they leave everything out in the open, but they, they still have to say, well, as much as this has been said and done, now we've got to go fight a battle. So we'll see what happens after the, the dust clears. Uh, and the dust kind of clears, and that's the end of the book. So you don't know where we pick up next time around. I'll just leave that out there for you. I don't want to leave a, a spoiler, but that's just a fact. Um, so the only setback for me, and I've said it before, was the lack of Miller. I mean, we get Miller, but I, you know, I need more Miller. We get loads of Dave, but Miller just kind of pops up rather than being a part of the ride along uh, i need more miller uh, the world needs more miller you, you know miller should be like every third sentence something about miller as far as i'm concerned uh, my final score and i've thought about this is an 8.8 .8. i enjoyed this a lot uh, but the only thing i really said uh, would maybe detract a little bit was the internal debate that lee has which is kind of like constantly over his women that could have been cut back just a little bit i know he's struggling but it isn't fun to hear somebody lament that they have to, you know, probably in the future at some point end up sleeping with tons of hot chicks and they're going to really feel bad about it. Uh, just deal with it and go bite the bullet on this, okay? Still, it's an amazing read and I can't wait for the next one. I know you won't be able to miss it. Um, I think the books just keep getting better and better. They're getting bigger. Uh, and I, I really can't wait to see where this goes. I, I think that... Um, I hope, I hope that Dean doesn't try to darken Lee up much more. I think right now he's at the, I'm a hero, and I'm the hardline hero, but anything more, he's going to get too dark, and he's going to go from being the hero to the heroic villain, which is something I think you've got coming out soon. And I don't think you want to compete with yourself on that. So, you know, just kind of keep it right where it's at, and you'll be really good. But I think you guys will love this book. I, I, the, the the audio is just incredible. There's no complaints at all. I loved every second of it. 14 hours flew by. Just flew by. All right. You know, thank you. Okay. Next up, here's the thing. I'm going to do another segment for Game Worlds. Yep, I'm not going to do what else have they done or, you know, is it lit RPG? 
And I do need some more suggestions for Is It Lit, guys. So if you've got some more Is It Lit stuff, let me know. I can try and figure it out. Um, but I'm going to do Game Worlds today. I'll just explain why here in a minute. So, Game Worlds. I'm going to do Far Cry Absolution by Urban Weight, narrated by Mark Bramhall, with a book length of 7 hours and 37 minutes. We've got whole families of folks living in shacks up in the hills. No power, no water. Grandma and the great-grandkids sleeping three to a bunk while mommy and daddy make more. We've got gun nuts. We've got bunkers and compounds. We've got free thinkers, anarchists, nihilists, Democrats, and God knows what else. But I'm telling you what I saw up there at Eden's Gate. All right, all right, all right. This is the first official World uh, Game World segment uh, where I take an a look at an actual book that's connected in some way to video games, be they board or video. Um, and, and I know I did the, the, the first one was the Dragonlance, but I, I kind of just did like the first six books of the whole series on that. And so I don't call that like a real review. That's me just saying, here is a game world you want to check out. So this one, I'm pretty much telling you about a book that relates to a game. This is the Far Cry 5 tie-in. It is a prequel to the Far Cry 5 game. Uh, so if you liked Far Cry, uh, I actually have um, some footage of myself. I don't know if Ramon is going to kind of cut me in right after I stop talking about this or not. But you'll see how bad I play. You know, I do play games, but I suck at them. And, and just to give you a heads up, um, I'd ask my son, I said, record me playing this game. Um, I put enough hours in, just record me for two minutes and just, you know, try to let me get something here. And what he did was he just recorded the, you know, I wanted to have him like have me playing as I did this. Um, he just put it right onto the game itself as we went. So, and of course it's just me walking slowly going around trying to find somebody to shoot for a couple minutes. So maybe I'll have Ramon just trim it back a little bit for you guys. So you can see just how bad I am at stuff. Uh, you know, maybe he, can, maybe he can just show my highlights, you know, like me sniping or something like that. I don't know. I'll leave it up to him. He's the, he's the, the smart tech guy and he, he knows how to put a show together. Um, but anyway, you can tell it was me just because of my massive amount of suckage. Um, so, uh, anyway, it's a fun game and I do enjoy playing it. Uh, but I do have a hell of a time driving in that, that game. I don't know what it is. So, all right. So hopefully now, uh, that's going to give me my street cred. Like, uh, you can say, yeah, he does actually play the Far Cry game. Uh, you know, here's where it is, and so that he knows what he's talking about. So the book, if I can focus on that now, like I said, is a prequel, and it does a pretty good job of setting things up for you to see exactly what is going on and what your character in the game will be facing. Now, that's about it. I actually suggest that you would read this before you play rather than after. Uh, that was not how I did it at all. I played the game and then I read it. Um, so you can look at it one of two ways. Like when pretty much I knew everything in the book about who was and who wasn't going to make it because if they weren't in the game, then they didn't survive, you know, in the book. So, you know, that, you know, that's the thing. Don't play the game until you read a book, because if you read a book, at least that way you won't know, like, well, yeah, this guy, this guy's going to get killed, or this, this lady's going to bite it right here, okay, um, so, you know, don't do that, uh, also, you, you know, you, you can just kind of look at it as a bit of fluff, and, and if you see it as how it helps to flesh out the world a little bit, and that's about all it is, um, because it really has no impact on the game, or, you know, your game play in any capacity, um, so, I mean, for me, I enjoyed the book. I think it was a decent adaptation. Um, but I don't think, you know, I'll get into it anyway. Um, I feel, I myself, I feel like the book had more menace than the game, which is a good thing. Uh, it was really dark, really dark and deep. Uh, and the book just held no joy. And that's not a bad thing. Um, it, this kind of felt like Deliverance cranked up to 11 with some of the backward bumpkins um, using religion to Ned Beatty, the town they lived in, you know, the county they're in. Um, and if you, you don't get that, if you don't get that reference, you know, if you're under 30, you probably won't get it. Go out and look it up because uh, you won't know what I'm talking about. Uh, 
but it'll make it even more creepy. The, you know, the Ned Beatty reference is just going to be way more creepy. Um, but that's that's basically what happens here. This book is dark, and it is not. I would say, it won't let up. It, it, there's no light. Um, once you start down that rabbit hole, you better be prepared, uh, because it is about like religious fanatics and their their control over people, how they brainwash people, and how they manipulate people. And, you know, how they destroy a town uh, to get their way. Um, and it's, it's just not something you go, boy, this was really fun, to, you know, to, to, to play. You know, you, th- th- you want to go on that game after you read this and just shoot the hell out of everybody. I mean, you just like, I, after I read it, I was like, I'm playing Far Cry 5 again. <laughs> you know, I'm going pop, 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 pop. And, you know, kill this dude, kill this dude. Because they just needed shooting. That's just how I looked at it. They just needed shooting. Um, you know, and for a first person shooter kind of game, um, which is basically what it is, uh, it's, it's, the book is pretty good. Like I guess it's deep. It's deep, but it's dark. Um, I don't know. Uh, the book focuses on a fella that is on the fringe of the cult and has never really become a part of it. Uh, he's ex military. He's an expert tracker. He's a decent shot. His name is Will. And he, he, the story centers on his struggle to come to terms with how he maintains a relationship with the insane cult in spite of his self-denial of what they do. You know, he kind of looks at it and says, I know what you're doing, but I can't walk away. I can't I can't get out of this, and I can't do something. I'm kind of just stuck in this limbo. And and you, you feel his quandary. I mean, you know, he, he's, he's conflicted, uh, and you can see it. But... Um, there's just there's no relief um he, he's he's stuck and and he doesn't want to do the right thing for a lot of the book he tries but he ends up not doing exactly what he should um now that, that's that's just about the best way i can say it um i don't know it, it's not what you'd expect i would have thought that the book would have focused more on the character's that are in the game. Like I thought, like seriously, this was going to be about the rise of John Seed, uh, how he garners so much power, what his goals really are, what what happens to get him to where he's at, how the town dealt with his appearance, anything like that along the way. And it didn't. You know, it took like a character. It took characters that you you've got no connection to if you play the game and you you read it after you play the game. There's no connection to them at all. I mean, and, and I grant you. Uh, in the game, you're this unnamed deputy, but you still know other characters in the game. Um, and especially that the way you interact from the very first moment, you know, there's three endings to the game. So you, you got, you know, how things happen, uh, how you interact with things, make makes decisions that you don't realize that are going to have consequences later on. Uh, you know, like two of the endings, like you can either surrender and become part of it, or you can not surrender and do what you would consider the right thing and the world kind of ends up blowing up with nuclear you know fallout going all over the place but there's a third ending in the game that's kind of hidden and it's right at the very beginning of the game and it's it's where you can make a choice to arrest somebody and if you just say nope i'm not going to arrest them um your your boss kind of just says you know that was probably the best thing you could do because no matter what you did if you had arrested him bad things would have happened and by letting him go, you've ended the game like that. I don't know if you guys know that or if you played it or not, but um, it's kind of funny we found that. Um, but that's it. So there's three endings. Um, and that's not even included in the book. Like, there's nothing that says, like, this is this is something you can do. I was looking for, like, maybe hidden clues to play things or, you know, that sort of stuff. And it's not there. Uh, there's no big, you know, reveals or revelations. There's no impact at all. I really felt um, that you could have taken the book made a few name changes, and it would have been a fine novel unto itself. Don't get me wrong, I like the book. It's very well written, you know, but it did have a generic feel to it. Um, it wasn't exactly specific to Far Cry. I still say you could take it, make it any kind of a cult, put any of the names, you know, take out, you know, John Seed, and, and make it, you know, Bob Tree. And guess what? It's going to be the same story, just not in in the Far Cry universe. Um and that, that kind of is problematic for me. I, I think that it should stand out. But again, you're talking about a first-person shooter game. Um, 
I don't know how you can make that more in depth and detailed and connected when, you know, I don't know, unless you're using the characters from the game itself. You know, if they were using unnamed Deputy 5 or whatever it is, because I think they're, you're the fifth deputy, um, or fourth, or whatever it is, um, if you were in there as that deputy, then that makes a difference. But you're not. You're in there as Will. And it, it just it, it could have been a book about any other place in the world at the, you know, about the same time. So um, the narration itself, it does fit the storyline. It sounds like it's being told from the perspective of a grizzled uh, old man, like a you know, Vietnam vet who pretty much just wants to live alone and forget the world outside of him. Uh, he's had some problems and he just joined this cult because he needed to get away and they were the only way to help him do that. Uh, the problem is, is that while it completely fits the Will character, it can also come across as a little monotone. I'm talking about the narration now, um, because when he talks, this is how he talks about stuff. The sun came up, and it really beat down on my face, and I watched the clouds roll across the sky, and I felt that this was the day something bad was going to happen. That's kind of how he talks, um, and it is the grizzled old veteran. I, I, I think it was really, you know, it's like, like um, with threadbare uh andrew sipple's book uh the narration there i said it before you know he sounded like mr french from you know family affair you know and i can't think of the guy's name right off the bat but um and he was the guy that read winnie the pooh uh and it, it, he sounded like winnie the pooh and i thought well that's really appropriate for this story because you've got like you know a guy that sounds like the narrator for winnie the pooh reading the book for a stuffed teddy bear that comes to life Brilliant. It works. Here you've got a grizzled old Vietnam vet that sounds like he's gargled glass and, and, you know, nails for, you know, the last 10 years uh, telling the story. And it, it does come across. I think it worked, but it can be very monotone. And I, I think that some people may have a problem with it being so monotone. Um, overall, I think the, the story is really worthwhile. Um Especially if you, you would have a better uh, idea of events, if you wanted to know events that happened just prior to starting off as Nameless Deputy. Um, as a tie-in, though, I still have to say th that while the tale is well-written, it's fairly generic uh, in the manner that it could have been a novel unto itself. Uh, again, you know, I, I think that unless you're talking about, like, God of War or Five Nights at Freddy's, where these things are very specific and you can't get around it uh, because they're they're tied in very closely to the game itself... This is just a first-person shooter, and there's just no way to make this more tied into the Far Cry universe because they change um, every so often without it being just like, you know, like it is right now. It's, it's a generic book. Um, you know, so it could have been a great story about an average everyday doomsday cult, and that's just what it was. Um, I'd like to say that, you know, give the Far Cry, you know, if, if you like Far Cry, give this a listen. You might enjoy it. I think... I enjoyed the book, uh, but I do think that um, as a tie-in, it was kind of a weak tie-in. I, I don't think it was as good as it could have been. Like I say, the generic aspect of it really took it down in my, my view for the game tie-in. Uh, but I enjoyed the Far Cry 5 game, you know, way more. Um, as you can see by the way I play, yeah, I suck. Now the, the mountain lion unsucks. So, you know, that sort of... <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that's how I play. I, I don't get too hyper. I, I kind of keep maintain a, a nice low profile. Uh, that is my couch potato attitude. Uh, just maintain flatline behavior. And I'm happy. So th that's the way the book is. It's, it's, it's got a monotone narration that fits. But if you don't like monotone, this is not for you. It has a good story, but it's a generic story. So... You may want to skip it on that. Um, you'd never know it was set in a game world. You know, there's just no game elements to it whatsoever. And that's really the biggest issue I have. Uh, there's just nothing there that says this comes from a game world or a video game tie-in in any way. Uh, so for me, I'm going to say it, it, was, it was a good read, but it could have been a book about anything. Anything. Uh, you know, it didn't have to tie into a video game, and it would have worked. So... Does it work well as a game tie-in novel, a world, you know, game world? No, 
um, this is probably, and it's funny because as I've worked through this, um, this is probably, you know, the weakest of all the game worlds that I've read uh, as I go through. Uh, and I started off with this thinking, boy, this this would be good because I really enjoyed the story. But the more I thought about it, uh, it, it was weak and it was not specific. Uh, it was a generic story. And and there was no real game tie-ins to anything other than a couple of characters. Um, and like I say, if you've played the game, you know who lives, who dies, you know who makes it, you know who doesn't. So certain things just take away from the book the more you look at it. And like I say, I like the book, but it's not for everybody, very clearly. Well, I really hope that you enjoyed that as much as I did, guys. Uh, there are some really great books on today's show uh, and I hope you'll give all of them a try uh, you know I wouldn't recommend them otherwise you know I didn't have a bad one in the bunch uh, all I can say is I've had a lot of fun listening to them so I know that you will too uh, I guess that all I have to say is thank you very much for listening uh, and watching and supporting the show I do appreciate you taking the time to watch or listen it means a great deal to us if you would like to support us you can like the Lit RPG podcast Facebook page or the YouTube page or just share and like the video. I sincerely hope you've liked and enjoyed our show. Please leave comments or suggestions down below, and feel free to tell me whatever you like. If you would like to, uh, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. Remember, please re leave a review. For any book that you've read or listened to, authors depend on reviews. It, it is like their, their life's blood. For the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast, I'm Ray. Keep listening.